Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 Cent, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, the promise of a better life, how an increasing number of Nigerian women are being trafficked to Europe where they're being forced into slavery and prostitution. We also meet American documentary photographer Stephanie Sinclair, who through her images is putting a human face to the tragedy that is child marriage. And the group of Jordanian women who are determined to scale Mount Everest, making them the first in the Arab world to do as such. But we begin in Nigeria, which has become the latest source of sex workers. Every year, thousands of young girls and women risk death as they make the long and arduous trip to Europe, desperate to escape a life of poverty. The number of Nigerian women travelling by boat from Libya to Italy almost doubled in 2016, with the majority believed to be forced into prostitution in Europe, as this report shows. Hustling on the streets of Benin City in Nigeria, dreaming of going to Europe. Desperate to escape poverty at home, the women here are easily lured by promises of jobs in Italy or France. The reality, whether in Palermo or Paris, is selling sex for as little as five to ten euros a time. Maybe I get there, I will marry, I have children, I live normal life, not to go there to Ozu again, because there the Ozu is not very easy. It's between life and death. Last year, 37,500 Nigerians crossed the Med on their way to Europe. Most were from Benin City, many destined for sexual slavery in the hands of the human traffickers. Miracle spent eight years in Italy as a sex worker, but even now, the mother of two says it's her dream to return, to escape the misery of her country. We Nigerians, we are so wicked. Only the richest ones, they know. But the poor ones, they are dying for the poverty. With the Nigerian economy struggling, euros sent back to families at home can go a long way. I don't regard these people as victims of people deceiving them to get. They wanted to go. And disregarding all risk, all moral implications, all values, they want to go because they know when they come, and have something to shoot, building houses, driving flashy cars. Nobody questions, how did you make the money? Victims or not, the women are unworldly, poorly educated and searching for a way out of poverty. Whichever way they look, home or abroad, it's a stark choice. Now, over the next 10 years, an estimated 142 million girls will be forced to marry to put it bluntly, that means every two seconds a young girl is married against her will. American documentary photographer Stephanie Sinclair has spent the last 15 years capturing the traumas associated with child marriages in places such as Nepal, Yemen and Nigeria. An exhibition of her photographs entitled Too Young to Wed is currently on display here in Paris and I'm delighted to say that she joins me in the studio today. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming in. Many photographers zip in and out of conflict zones. Many don't really engage in terms of, you know, they take the photos and they leave, but they don't engage with the subjects that they're taking photos of. But that didn't happen with you, did it? No. Um, it's, it's kind of hard with this subject material to, um, to kind of let go and, and not follow up with, with the girls that I can. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I've been working on this project for about 15 years now. Let's take a look at some of the images, and particularly two of them from Yemen, which I found incredibly striking. The first is of two young girls with their grooms. What's the story behind this particular image? Those two young girls, their names are Tahani and Ghada. They're eight years old. And actually, that portrait was done. Um, it was done with cooperation of the sheikh, the local sheikh in the village, because, you know, in that community... Although um, they were practicing kind of an extreme force of child marriage where the girls are very young and the men are much older, um, they didn't really understand the consequences, the negative consequences. What, what are the age differences between the young girls and the men that they're marrying? Um, these two girls, like I said, they they're, were eight years old and their husbands were in their 30s. And did they have any idea of what was coming up, what lay ahead for them? To my understanding, uh, Tahani, the girl in, the, in pink, 
she had been married actually for two years at that point. So she was married at six. And, um, you know, I do believe that she, um, she had to follow through with all the wifely duties um, that were put upon her. D- despite the young age. Yeah. And um, Rada um, was not in that situation. She was still living with her. Um, she was living with t- her father. And in fact, Tahani's groom was uh, Rada's older brother. And let's talk about the second image, which is of a young girl lifting the veil up in somewhat of a defiant fashion. What's her story? Yeah, um, that's Najud Ali. Uh, she became kind of an international heroine of, um, because she requested a divorce when she was only 10 years old. And she really inspired a lot of um, other girls to, to kind of follow suit. Um, she went to the courthouse by herself and was looking for um, an attorney to represent her. And she met a woman named Shada Nasser who represented her in court and, and she was able to get a divorce and return to school. And now with the conflict in, in Yemen, reports are um, coming out from you know, the UN Population Fund that, that there are even more marriages happening because of the instability there. You've also made a video recently. I'd just like to take a look at a clip from that. Extraordinarily moving images there, Stephanie. Now, many in the developed world fail to understand the long-term societal impact of child marriage. And in these cultures themselves, these are traditions that go back thousands of years. So in one way, how do you change the cultural mindsets in that sense? And also, how can we in the developed world do more to help? Um, That's a good question. Well, first of all, we did have child marriage in our communities as well. So, I mean, people didn't, you know, part of this comes from the fact that people didn't live as long as they do now. And they didn't, it wasn't common for people to have, you know, for for boys or girls to have the education that they do today, ed- educational opportunities. And so, um, so you're seeing this really in places where um, there are, uh, there are less. There's less access to education. There's um, more in agricultural communities where you need hands in the field. Um, I don't think that parents are trying to hurt their children, um, but I do feel that they just don't understand how it perpetuates the cycle of poverty. And um, and the the film that was done in you know on the year it was around the year anniversary of the earthquake that they had. And this is a community that did want to, um, you know, curb child marriage practices, but then you have, they're living kind of on the brink of poverty as it is, like where they're just living, you know, farming to eat. And um, then you have your town gets wiped out in an earthquake. And how do you, you know, you have fewer options and you have, you know, it's harder to feed the people you do have in your, in your community. So then you can see in situations like that, how child marriage will increase. And how can we in the developed world help? I think that um, we need to continue raising awareness about the issue and, um, and holding governments accountable um, to the laws that are mostly in place. Um, you know, most countries, Yemen doesn't have a minimum age of marriage, but most countries um, do have, have laws in place that say child marriage is illegal. They're just not enforced. And so we need to keep that pressure on. Um, and I think that there's many organizations, including my own, Too Young to Wed, that are working directly with um, girls in the field. And I think that um, supporting their education, supporting, um, you know, because education is the, the most protective fa- factor that can, you know, in fact, impact the girls' lives and, and keep them safe. So um, promoting education and making that available to girls, the most vulnerable girls, which are in the poorest regions of the world. In this digital era, does the power of the image still hold? Absolutely. I think that, I mean, people communicate more visually than ever before. So I think that imagery and photographs is incredibly powerful today. Um, I think you have to, but I think that there's an opportunity and a responsibility in a lot of ways to say something with your work because um and, and because people are communing that, communicating that way, I think it's um, really important to take advantage of that. And clearly you have done so as well, such. I'm trying. <laughs> Stephanie, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.
And finally, a pioneering group of Jordanian women have begun their training to climb Mount Everest. Their aim is to scale the peak in April 2018, making them the first women from the Arab world to achieve such a goal. Rebecca Rosman has more. These Jordanian women are hoping to become the first all-female team from the Middle East to summit Mount Everest. They're hoping to make a statement that will inspire other Arab women. Our goal as Arab Jordanian women is to prove that yes, she can. One of the most important aims of our group is to make Arab women understand that you can choose where you go, wherever it is in the world, and no one can tell you otherwise. While the expedition isn't until April 2018, the group came to Nepal earlier this month for training, where they received lessons from climbing experts and local guides. The icy steep terrain comes in sharp contrast to Jordan, where the country's highest point, Jabal Am um Adami, is only a fifth as high as Mount Everest. Each of the five women are climbing to raise awareness for causes that are close to them. Aber Sikali, an architect and designer, is trying to build a more sustainable tent. She's planning to test her design's durability during the climb. There are a billion people, most of them children, who have no home to live in. I want to take this opportunity to talk about this subject and present a solution by testing out my tent on Mount Everest. The women will have two more training trips before their big summit. Later this year, they'll have a training at the Pasu DR peaks in Pakistan, followed by the Aconcagua in Argentina in early 2018. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page, that's France 24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. So until our next show, bye for now.